Hey there, and welcome to the Apartment Building Investing Podcast. My name is Michael Blanc. I'm super excited that you're here. In today's show, I interview Russell Gray from the Real Estate Guys because he thinks that there's something else going on behind the scenes with coronavirus, and it's not volatile stock markets, not unemployment, it's not spiking gold prices, it's not falling interest rates, it's something else. What is that? Stay tuned. I'm Michael Blanc. Let's do this. <laughs> So I'm Michael Blanc, and I teach investors how to become financially free with real estate, right? Now, if you love the show, leave me a review. If you haven't already subscribed, make sure you do that right now so you don't miss a single episode we put every single week. So for a while now, pundits have been forecasting this black swan event. We knew we were in a bubble somehow. We knew we were or due for a correction, but we didn't know what it would do. And certainly pandemic was not a my, list of my things that would prick that bubble, but certainly it did. So... In this episode interview with Russell Gray, you're going to find out how you can, what you can do now to protect your wealth. Find the opportunities hidden in what seems like a problem. How can you possibly not only survive, but take advantage of the opportunity? And you're going to see that people and businesses and money will start migrating to safety. Uh, and you see a thing, you see certain symptoms going uh, happening, certain things, but what's really going on behind the scenes? Some will win and some will lose. And we want to make sure in this episode that you are going to be one in uh, a position to thrive. And that's what we're going to get into right now. So this episode is sponsored by your Investor Incubator Mentoring Program. Check it out at themichaelblanc.com forward slash mentor. So let's get right in the show with Russell Gray. Russ, how's it going today? Good, man. Happy to be here. One of the things that you, you say, and I was like, I don't quite understand, is that the, the big coronavirus story isn't interest rates or spiking old prices or volatile stock markets or anything like that. You said there's actually a bigger story behind it. Can you uh, please share with you what that big story actually is? Well, yeah. I mean, what I learned in 2008 is there's all kinds of stuff that happens way up in the rafters of the financial system that, uh, in fact, I, the metaphor I use is, uh, or analogy, I always get those two mixed up, uh, is the old game that, uh, you're probably old enough to play this game when you were a kid, Mousetrap. And in the game of Mousetrap, you build this uh, elaborate machinery that there's a chain of events that starts and then one thing leads to another through a whole chain of events and then eventually the little mousetrap falls on the mouse. Well, I was that little mouse running around in the mortgage business in 2006, 2007, thinking everything was awesome and I'm making all kinds of money and I'm all that in a bag of chips. And then all of a sudden the trap fell down on me, credit markets imploded and I had no idea, I didn't see it coming. And so once I kind of shook the dust off and quit blaming the economy for my own ignorance and stupidity, uh, I started asking myself, well, who saw it coming and how did they know? And that's where we discovered people like Peter Schiff, we started paying more attention. We were already friends with Robert Kiyosaki, but we were less about listening than we were about kind of riding coattails and uh, trying to rebut anything he said that uh, contraindicated what we were thinking or wanting to do. So we were living in an echo chamber. And so I came out of that and I really started studying credit markets and bond markets. And that led me to really understanding currencies and the financial system in general, because uh, ultimately your real estate investments are really driven by employment, which are driven by credit markets because uh, businesses are driven by credit markets and uh, driven by interest rates and the mortgage side of things. And that's also very much driven in the bond market. And so the context, as you talked about, of real estate is understanding the migration of people and money uh, through the system and when it's going to puddle up uh, in an area or when it's going to leave. You know, when you're in a rising tide, all boats lift. But when things recede, as Warren Buffett says, you get a chance to find out who's swimming naked. But if you don't understand that ebb and flow of money through the credit system, then you really don't know whether the tide's coming in or the tide's going out or how to prepare. So that's kind of how it started for me uh, in terms of studying the system. So when the COVID-19 thing struck, I just started asking myself, okay, I can see the health crisis and I can see the official response in terms of uh, the lockdown and the, the, both the monetary and the fiscal stimulus response, what's next? And so to me, it goes from uh, health crisis to economic crisis, which is a cessation of commerce, meaning no paychecks, no revenue. Uh, and then what's the logical conclusion of that? 
a debt crisis because when people don't have income, they can't make payments. And when they can't make payments, debt goes bad. Well, that's what happened in 2008, except it was just a little small contingency of subprime borrowers up in, in some you know, uh, quiet corner of the uh, system. And they went bad and it set a whole chain reaction, a daisy chain contagion through balance sheets because of the leverage. And that's the part that nobody saw coming, that nobody understood the role of derivatives and how much leverage was there. And so a little bit of bad debt expanded into a complete threat of the financial system. Well, we're more vulnerable today to that than we ever were. So that's the next stop in this four phase cascading crisis. To fix it, the Fed is going to try to paper over it by printing trillions and trillions of dollars. And they've already done it and they're going to continue to do it and they've pledged to do it. Well, what could happen? Well, I mean, you know, a currency crisis is what happens in, in, in Zimbabwe or Venezuela when a currency completely uh, loses value. So the Fed is able to print unlimited amounts of dollars because it's the world's reserve currency. And so those dollars, those excess dollars don't end up in the United States. And so he says, well, yeah, but they just, they printed all this money and they did direct deposits into people's checking accounts. That's all Americans. Yes, but where did they spend the money? Amazon, Walmart. Well, where's all that stuff come from? China. So where did all the dollars end up? China. They didn't end up here. Now, the problem is, is that if the rest of the world uh, decides they don't need dollars because the dollar is no longer the world's reserve currency, there's some other alternative. And there's already been a lot of movement towards that. And I can detail that if you care to. But the point is, at whatever point, if those dollars come home, uh, if exporting dollars to the world has suppressed inflation at, in the United States, then what is the effect of all those dollars coming back? Well, that's in hyperinflation. That's kind of what happened in 1971 when we went off the gold standard. The dollar collapsed. Oil prices tripled. Uh, we had stagflation, no economic activity, but rising prices. So the tee up is there for that to happen. And I just think most people economically aren't aware of how the system works or why that's even a possibility. So the risk of inflation, in your opinion, is, is, is high. Uh, the risk of devaluation of the dollar is, is high. You see a lot of things converging. A lot of people have talked about this for, for a long while. Let's talk about the potential solution. We already talked about precious metals, right? So as the dollar goes down or inflation goes up, precious metals are, are valued higher. Therefore, if I own precious metals, they're going to go up higher. Therefore, I'm benefiting from inflation or the devaluation dollar. Is that, is that about not right? You're not benefiting. You're not benefiting. You're only preserving. Gold doesn't make you rich. It's not an investment. It's an alternative form of liquidity. Think of it as cash that doesn't go down in value because of printing. It doesn't make you rich. You don't get rich by having money in the bank, but you have safety. You preserve, preserving your 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 purchasing power. So uh, a lot of people try to trade gold. And this is where I disagree. I mean, and I've had this conversation with our friend, you know, uh, Brian London many times, because a lot of people who claim to be gold bugs really are looking at gold as a trading vehicle. And their ultimate goal is to accumulate dollars, right? A true gold person realizes gold is money and they're not interested in accumulating dollars. I don't want to go from cash to gold to cash. I w just like a real estate investor doesn't want to go from cash to real estate to cash. You don't want your round trip doesn't, you're not wealthy if you end up in cash. What you want to do is you want it with real estate, you want to go from cash to real estate to cash flow. And that's where you get rich. Cash flow makes you rich, right? With, with gold, you want to go, you, you, you want to go from cash to gold and you want to stay with gold. And gold is like equity and you want to grow it on your balance sheet. Uh, but don't look at it as a trading vehicle. It's just a place to store liquidity. Now, you guys are obviously the real estate guys. So how do you feel about real estate and holding real estate or investing in real estate uh, in, an, in this kind of uh, world that, that may happen? It's a perfect world for it. It's perfect. It, you know, when we wrote Equity Happens, it was all based on the thesis that the dollar was going to continue to lose value as it has since its inception, uh, since it was flipped over, you know, in 1913. Uh, and you can go to the St. Louis Fed website and pull up the purchasing power of the dollar and you can see the chart. I'm not, not making that up. I mean, the government's own or the Federal Reserve's own 
own numbers tell you that it's lost 97% of its value since it started. And it, that's happening again. So, uh, so real estate is the perfect vehicle to short the dollar because real estate favors the, de I mean, uh, sorry, uh, inflation, printing of money favors the debtor. That's why they do it, right? The government's in debt. It's all about debt, 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 debt. Real estate is the ultimate vehicle to short the dollar because you can accumulate debt, meaning you can, you can spend to dollars at today's value and purchase an asset and then pay it back with tomorrow's dollars that's worth less because of inflation. And that's why when you, when you, you, know, you buy a $50,000 property and put $40,000 down or uh, $10,000 down and get a $40,000 mortgage, and then 10 years later, that $50,000 house is worth $100,000 purely because of inflation, you have outpaid you know, you, you, you've created a huge gain, 10,000 down payment. And that's all created. That's why equity happens. The thing is the challenge with equity in real estate is if you leave it there, the market can take it right back away again. So as soon as it's there, the smart thing to do is get it out. If real estate is a good place to be, you keep adding to your real estate portfolio. But the thing that I didn't do in 2008 that I think is a smart thing to do is to always peel off a chunk of that equity and park it in, park it in precious metals and build your liquidity outside of the dollar uh, so that if the currency were to fail, you're in a good position to do that. So real estate is perfect for accumulating debt and cash flows to service the debt and tax breaks. Uh, you just need to make sure that you're conservatively structured, as I'm sure you do. And of course, the beautiful thing about being in multifamily is you're going to be getting commercial mortgages, which means that you're going to be forced by the underwriters to have liquid reserves, and you're going to be forced to have good coverage ratios. And, um, and then, you know, just as a prudent operator, you should be picking markets and demographics that are likely to hold up well in economic difficult times, meaning you're not top of market in the richest, but you're in the middle uh, where people above you can move down if, if times get tough and where if times get good, people below you can move up and you're always kind of in that sweet spot. Now, what kind of, what kind of real estate strategies do you like right now heading into this kind of uh, environment? There's so many different than, uh, ones that you can, you can choose. Which ones do you like right now? Well, I mean, besides the obvious cash flow, right, and leverage, um, I think that the, the, in terms of niches, I think you need to stick in this environment no matter what you're investing in. If you're a stock investor, uh, whatever, I think you need to invest in things that are real and essential. So, uh, for example, um, we're finding right now that one of the most stable places to be in terms of real estate is residential. Why? Because even when people don't go to the mall, even when people don't go to the office, they still need a place to sleep at night, every night, even when they're working at home. So residential is much more secure than any other niche of real estate. So for that reason, I like residential. Uh, in terms of economic drivers for a marketplace, I still like energy. I know energy is under distress right now, but I don't think energy or the need for energy is going anywhere and those jobs cannot be exported. So I would look at the current weakness in energy markets as an opportunity to go shopping uh, with the idea that down the road, uh, even if that energy is produced and shipped to China and India and the United States falls down a few notches in terms of an economic superpower, at the end of the day, markets that are supported by energy revenue are probably going to be resilient. I would put agriculture in that category. Uh, now, it's hard to do agriculture in the United States. You know, we like that offshore because of, you know, the affordability, the labor, the regulations and all of that. But that way you don't have to get the local economy right. You're investing in an income producing piece of land whose product is not shelter or a place to conduct business, but it's a product uh, that's renewable that gets shipped anywhere on the planet where prosperity exists. So I like that. Um, I think healthcare. Uh, is not a bad place to be because, you know, people can, can uh, skip a lot of things and governments can let a lot of things be neglected. But uh, housing and healthcare and energy are three areas that the government is going to use whatever means they have. And they may lose some of their means, but whatever means they have, uh, they're definitely going to put into supporting healthcare. Uh, and that can't be exported. So I think real estate that, and economies that are related to that are important. And the other one is distribution. I mean, I understand 3D printing and maybe someday that, you know, we'll just be able to order on the internet and print our stakes and print our, you know, uh, things that we need. But I think we're a ways away from that. 
so distribution, again, whether the boxes or whether the products are being uh, in India, China, uh, Mexico, if they're coming into the United States to get moved from, uh, from point A to point B, they're going to get distributed. They might not go through a retail store. Uh, they might end up going through an industrial warehouse. But at the end of the day, uh, they're going to get distributed somehow, some way. And so uh, logistics hubs, anything that's related to logistics is probably not a bad place to be. So the concept there is you just have to look at the marketplaces and the real estate and ask, does it serve a basic essential need? And is it geographically linked to where that economic activity is nearly impossible to move someplace else. If you do that, I think you're going to have more uh, resiliency in your portfolio. Yeah, I love that. I, I love the education you've been putting out and you're broadening all of our collective perspectives. Now, you said it before, how can people find you and the real estate guys? Um, well, I mean, you know, any one of those emails. Uh, and another thing I'm working on, Michael, is a tutorial on how to convert real estate equity into precious metals. Uh, to mitigate a lot of the risks in the marketplace right now. And so that's precious equity at realestateguysradio.com. So any one of those emails or just visit our website, realestateguysradio.com. And uh, we're just getting ready to uh, launch. We're finally bringing our website into the 21st century. So we're just getting ready to launch that. It's going to be mobile friendly. And it's been a big project and I can take zero credit. The only reason it's getting done is because I was smart enough to give it to a project manager uh, and she's awesome. And I uh, try not to do it myself. Every I've tried three times in the past to do it myself. It never got over over the line this time it's getting done but anyway yeah and listen to the show you know realestateguysradio.com your favorite podcast outlet we put out a podcast once a week been doing it since uh, 2007 i think we started podcasting in earnest in 2009 and we just i think we just went over six or seven million unique downloads uh 15 or 16 million all time i mean so we're, we're doing okay in a crowded space and i think that uh, our you our message is a little bit unique so i think you'll you'll like it yeah, you guys uh, invented podcasting. You've been doing it for so long. But I, I enjoy hanging out with you and Robert at your syndication events and your goal-setting retreats. And the cruise was canceled this year, which is a real a real shame. My kids weren't very happy about that. But uh, thank you so much, uh, Russ, for coming on the show today. Yeah, well, the cruise wasn't canceled. We just moved it. It went from yeah. being Summit yeah, well, at Sea to the real cruise. Su yeah. Summit on Screen. Next yeah, year, it's going to be Summit on Sand. Yeah. We're doing it at our resort in Belize. So it's going to be epic. So we're just getting ready to announce that too. Uh, McElroy's in, so that's going to be great. And several of the people that we talk to. So yeah, appreciate being on the show. Michael, keep up the good work. I love what you're doing as an educator, as a broadcaster, and obviously as an investor. Uh, you know, I think there's plenty of room for many, many, many more people to get in. Uh, I think we're all part of the same mission. Main Street, investing in Main Street. Uh, you know, in this cancel culture, if I had my druthers and I could cancel something, I'd like to like to cancel Wall Street and cancel the Fed. And, uh, you know, the only way to do that is to have people putting their money uh, directly into Main Street, not not funneling their money through those guys. But that that's that's my personal rant. That was Russell Gray with The Real Estate Guys. If you're not already listening to his podcast, make sure you do that because it's awesome. It really complements what we talk about specifically in multifamily and syndications, gives you a bigger context, also educates you about other types of investments like precious metal agriculture. So definitely check that out as well. Now, uh, if you're interested in, in investing with us, uh, Nighthawk Equity is our is our investment firm, nighthawkequity.com. Then just uh, join our investment club, and uh, that will allow you to schedule a call with us. And once we do that, if there's a fit between what you're looking for and what we kind of opportunities we have, then we can present you with some upcoming opportunities. That's nighthawkequity.com, and click the Join button.